Hey, hey, everybody. It is Thursday lunchtime. And so we are here for our weekly live coaching sessions. If you are new to hopping in, this is something that we're gonna be doing every Thursday over the lunch hour, specifically from noon to 1230 Central Standard Time. You're gonna be hearing from myself and some of the other fabulous coaches on the Grief Guru coaching team uh, to learn more about their stories. And each week we're gonna highlight a specific topic or a specific part of our grief relief framework to kind of educate you. And then we're also going to leave time each and every week for your questions, your comments, your whatever you're dealing with as it relates to grief. We really want this time to be interactive and encouraging and informational. So absolutely uh, drop a comment or a question at any point and we will be sure to answer that. But I'm super thrilled to have one of our fabulous coaches with us today, Kristen Lohoff. She is a grief recovery champion. She has she has earned her title and her expertise the hard way uh, by recovering from tremendous loss and grief. And we are going to be talking today about cumulative grief or compound grief and what exactly that is and how we can recover from tremendous loss. So first, Kristen, why don't you just share with folks uh, your story and how it is that you became familiarized with cumulative grief in the first place? Yeah, the, the thing that nobody really ever wants to learn about <laughs> right. you know, cumulative grief. Well, <laughs> Kelly, thanks for having me on today. I really appreciate it. It's, it's fun to be here and <laughs> fun to talk about grief is kind of a weird thing. But uh, yeah, I I like that intro. I learned it the hard way. Um, cumulative grief is is really just that idea that you've lost a lot of people often in a very short period of time. And and mine has been kind of spread throughout my lifetime with some pretty major losses. Um, it started when I was seven years old and my father died, which is traumatic for any child. Mm -hmm. um, my father had been sick for a lot of my childhood so I, it wasn't a wholly unexpected thing, but I don't know that any seven-year-old is ready for that to happen, or even any adult for that matter. Um, and then, you know, after that loss, I, I grew up without my dad, and I really thought I knew a lot about grief. I thought mm -hmm. I knew pretty much everything there was to know um, until I started being hit with a lot of family losses. And that started in 2015 when my mom died. Um, she had Alzheimer's disease and she died from that. And then two months later, her sister, my aunt died. And then I think it was about five months later, my father-in-law died. Uh, a couple months after that, an uncle died. And then a few months after that, my cousin, who I was very close to, died from cancer. And just a month after that, another cousin died from cancer at the exact same time my husband was being diagnosed with cancer in the hospital. And uh, five months after that, my husband died. So in a, in a 24 month period, it was, it was a little less than two years. I, I lost seven people. Wow. And, yeah. And pretty much like when, when you think of the people in your life who are your support group and your go-to people, um, I had lost pretty much all of them. Wow. Just talk about that. Just talk <laughs> about that for a minute. Like, when it happens and then it happens again and then it happens yeah. again, like how did, did you just go into like kind of a numb, like autopilot kind of perpetual place of shock? Yeah, absolutely. You just waited for the next shoe to drop. And uh, especially when there was like just every few months um, and they were, they were major people in our lives, you know, right. especially the parents and my cousin and my husband, those are major people in your life. And uh, yeah, you, you have one loss. And I, I remember when my mom, when my mom died, it, it was hard, you know, she had Alzheimer's. She also, it was, it was a progressive loss that I kind of knew would come. It came sooner than was expected, but you know, it, it still is hard. And then two months later to the day her sister died very unexpectedly. And I remember going to that um, service and I couldn't walk through the door. Mm. My, my, the, my legs gave out and I actually had to sit down at the back of the, the funeral home and, and just take a breath. And my husband was there to support me. And that was kind of a key to it. You know, we, my husband and I held each other up. And then, mm. you know, a few months later, his dad died and we did it again. And you just, Numb is a really great word to describe it. Just complete numbness and autopilot 
Um, mm -hmm. And it becomes an expectation. My children, too, at the time, my youngest daughters were oh, nine and 11 years old. Um, they're both teenagers now, but at that time they were pretty young and they just kept looking at us. Who's next? Right. Um, yeah. My youngest daughter really began to fear realistically that anyone who went in the hospital would automatically die because that oh, was yeah. her experience. Wow. So let's talk about that for a second. Like, have you have you even now been able to fully come out of that expectation and what intentional steps did you have to do for yourself and for your daughters to come out of that, anticipating that all the time? Yeah, well, we still have pieces of it left. We're still very, very nervous about any medical diagnosis, even if it's mundane. Um, my daughters had fillings just a month ago in their teeth and they were extremely nervous about mm -hmm. having cavities and what that would mean and would they have to be put under and they weren't, mm -hmm. but they were very nervous. So they have a lot of nervousness in approaching any medical thing. And I, I did too. Um, and I still do to a certain extent. I, I'm fearful that something bad will still happen, but not as much as I was. And it was a lot of intentional work, um, a lot of intention, a lot of conversations, a lot of help. Um, I did seek therapy after my husband died for a period of time, and that was very helpful for me. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I, I had some tools I used that I think I learned pretty young, you know, as someone who lost their father that I've brought back and used again, and, and things like healthy escapes. Mm -hmm. um, I play instruments, and my music still is a healthy escape for me. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a place for me to just forget. You know, some people have art. Mm -hmm. um, some people like to read, uh, crafting, that kind of thing. For me, it's music. And, and that helped a lot. And another thing that has really helped me is there's so many things in life you can't control. Um, oftentimes, you can't control the loss of a loved right. one. You really, you know, you're powerless. But there are things in our lives we can control. And I learned ways to take advantage of that and really plan things um, and, and consciously make sure that I was taking time for self-care and I was doing things that made me, that allowed me to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. That's so powerful. I feel we, we have it backwards. We think we can control the things that we can't control. And we try so many people spend their whole lives trying to control the things that they actually have no control over. And, and what we miss in that process is learning how to control the one and only thing that we can control, which is ourselves, which yeah. is our thoughts and how we respond to things. And people feel so out of control with grief that it's so overwhelming and it just hits you out of nowhere and it can feel very out of control. Like it's impossible to have control. But I think that's one of the most powerful things that I learned and that we help people learn is, is how to train your brain, how to train your thoughts, how to, how to take those moments to before responding, right? Like it doesn't have to be automatic that you actually can condition your mind and you can learn coping skills and, and skills so that when it does show up, it's not so debilitating, but that's so ironic that we, we, we try to put our control in the wrong place. Like we spend all this time trying to control stuff that we will never be able to control. And then the one thing that we can control, we don't learn how to do effectively. And, and the thing is, if we will learn how to control the thing that we can control, whatever happens out here, we're going to be okay. You know, we're, we're going to know how to be okay and respond to it. Um, yeah. So you've, yeah. Because we've built the tools, you, you've, you've, you know, stacked your little toolbox full of the things you need to get through that. Yeah. Right, right. And then that's the biggest thing for me and why I, why I got into this work is I was like, this is, these are learnable skills. Like there's a skill set when it comes to grieving and mourning and moving through and getting back to loving your life. It's an actual skill set. And I'm like, why is nobody teaching this? <laughs> You yeah. know, like, so just as an encouragement for everybody who's watching, like it, it can be taught. It's something you can learn and you, you're not going to be great day one, but just like any other skill set, as long as you practice and are consistent and you learn from people who've been doing it a long time or no, you know, and we can show you the way, like it, it can be something that you can become proficient or even excellent at, you know, and, and I hate to say it too, but like, it, certainly in your case, but in my case, like, why do we think that when one trauma happens, like, well, okay, we got through that. We're good now. You know, like we think that, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. One and done. Like I, you know, I had done. my, I had my trauma. Now I'm just going to be good, you know? And that's why it was so, um, you know, in, in my case, it was a little over a year between the two. And so I felt like, um, I just, st- I just got back up on my feet and then it took me out again, you know? And so, um, mm-hmm. all of these things just affect your recovery journey and your recovery process. Um, Oh, so someone's commenting. I just want to say that um, Rosie said she lost her mother and father, wait, mother, father-in-law, son-in-law, and husband in a 24-month time span. Oh, my goodness, Rosie, you should be up on this panel with us because yeah. <laughs> that's- You've been there. That is just a lot. Yeah. yeah. I want to circle back to like, so you said you went numb in an autopilot. Tell me about when did you start to come out of that and what did that process look like for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Yeah, I was in autopilot all throughout the losses. I would say like you talked about, you had that year and a half and, and Rosie had time periods in between too, I'm sure. And that next one hits you and you're, you're just pushed, pulled right back where you were and, and you begin to just function in this autopilot mode where you get through your days and you're numb to most things that lasted for quite a while Uh, the people that I worked with they watched me go through all of these losses Mm -hmm. and uh, they said to me afterwards that they, they didn't know you know how are you even standing which is a question we get a lot and it's a silly question because you don't really have a choice. Right. Um, but you know, I understood their intent and they're like, they, they don't know how, how do you survive something like this? And that's why we're here talking about it. Um, for me, I, I made a pretty conscious decision early on that I was going to practice some tools and tricks to, to help me feel better. And I, and I promised myself, I knew I wasn't ready to feel joy in the beginning days, Mm -hmm. it took months, but Mm -hmm. I told myself that I would be, that I would be allowed to be joyful, that it would be okay for me to be joyful, even though, especially losing my husband, that I would, that I was allowed to still be happy and have happy moments. So I practiced that intentionally um, a lot of days through a gratitude journal and just ending each day with three things that I was grateful for. And some days I was grateful for the fact that I showered (laughs) Um, and some days I was grateful for the fact that I got the kids where they needed to go. And some days I was grateful for, you know, a beautiful weather and a walk in the woods. So that gratefulness journal kind of helped me slowly allow myself to feel the joy. And then there's, there's one day that I really noticed a big change. and, And then I knew I had, I had succeeded. Yeah. And so Rosie's just asking, so I'm curious if you can remember, I just want to touch on two things real quick. Number one, I love, love, love that from the beginning when you were like, I'm not ready to feel joy right now, but I'm going to start preparing the stage and and plant the seed that I will experience joy in the future. That's so powerful and so amazing. And you know, when we work with clients, like those are some of the first foundational things that we help people to do. Like, you know, what do you believe and what do you want? Let's get clear about where you're trying to go for your future so that we can help you. And and I know so many spouses that just instantly say, I'll never be happy again. And that's the sentence they give themselves and they never come out of it. So like, I'm so, I mean, I'm always impressed by you, but I'm so impressed that you had the for, that thought for the future, even if you weren't ready for it in that moment. But do you remember either the timing of having that thought or the timing of when you started doing this gratitude journal? Because Rosie is saying that um, it'll be a year for her in July from when she lost her husband. And she's so she's very interested in kind of your time frame. Yeah, Rosie, first of all, I'm so sorry. And that first year, I mean, all the years are hard. We know that, but uh, the anniversary date is coming up and and I'm sure you're feeling it already. and, And I'm just really sorry. Um, my time frame was probably pretty quick. Um, and I don't necessarily know why I do wonder, I've thought a lot about it and I do wonder if it's because I had lost my father when I was a child. So I had some familiarity with digging myself out of it. Um, I, I'm not sure, but my husband died in October of 2017 and by November, actually, yeah, it was a month later, um, my gratitude journal was already starting. Um, but it was filled with things like I got up today. Right. 
you know, <laughs> I was grateful for not crying for three hours. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I had to pick very tiny baby steps and then just continue to build. Um, and what I did, because for me, uh, travel is healing, nature is healing. And I knew that about myself. And I knew that I just really needed to physically get away from my house. It held too many memories. My community held too many memories. And I just wanted to get away. Uh, so I planned a pretty extensive trip, but I planned a trip um, to get out. And that was when, while I was on that trip, that was when I really first felt the true moments of joy. So that was, if I gave myself a timeline, um, that would have been in June. So about six months, seven months after my husband died was the first moment. It was a fleeting moment, but I recognized it. And, and, and that helped to know that I could get there once I knew that I could do it again. Love that. And Rosie is saying she's going to start a gratitude journal. I love that because Rosie, what's so powerful is like whatever you focus on grows. And so if you focus, if you can find the smallest things to be thankful for and appreciative of, like the, you will find more and more things to be thankful for and appreciative of. And if you focus on the hurt and the pain and the absence, like that is what's going to stay looming in your mind and in your day to day. Now, obviously we're not saying deny or suppress or don't deal with your emotions. No, but what we, you need to give it proper space in your life and proper outlets and proper boundaries and timelines so that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't rule you, you rule it kind of thing. And, um, yeah, she's saying that she's a pretty positive person. So the numbness is so strange for her. Yeah. So Rosie, I mean, if there's any comfort in the fact that it's totally normal, like I, I wish, I wish the fact that it was normal would be enough to fix it, but at least uh, understand that it's, it's normal. And the analogy I like to use a lot of times is imagine you went through very extensive surgery. Like Rosie, imagine that you had a major surgery and how would you expect to be operating in your life? You know, you would not expect yourself to be at full steam. You would not expect your body or your mind to be working, you know, appropriately. It's going to take some time for your body and mind to figure out how to do life now post-surgery. And that's really what it is with loss. And, and you've had multiple. So you had multiple major surgeries. You know, you, you're just discovering yourself and your life again. And it's going to take, it's going to take a minute. It's going to take much more than a minute, but it is, it can be um, a powerful time in your life as well. It can be a time for growth and exploration and, you know, discovering new things about yourself, discovering new things that you want to do in your life. You know, it really, it doesn't um, make the hurt or the pain of it go away, but it can be a really powerful time. Maybe Kristen, talk about that a little bit. Like how has this, you know, how has that mega Super Bowl, a uh, prolonged Super Bowl of grief, like how has that changed you as a person and how has it changed your life, how you live your life now going forward? Oh, wow. Yeah, it has. Uh, I, I, I read a lot of, of books of people who've gone through loss and losing a spouse and how it changed them. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of people make that and any loss of, of a person in your life, it changes you. Um, a loss of a spouse, in my opinion, is slightly different because you had a plan to move through life with that person. And suddenly that's gone along with a lot of the plans and dreams you had that included that person. Now everything is you. Um, so it's, it's changed me a lot and it's, it's taught me to appreciate life so much more than I did before my losses. Right. Um, it, it's taught me about what, what things in life are truly important for me and what things in life are, are not. And yeah. it, it lets me focus my energy on the things that I value. And I don't put the energy towards those things that don't matter to me anymore because I don't want to waste those moments. Yes. Yes. That that's one of the gifts, like to have the clarity of perspective. And so, like you said, like even being grateful, like what a beautiful perspective, like to be grateful for a solid night's sleep or to be mm -hmm. grateful, for, like those little things in life. And if you can learn to see through that lens, 
your experience with living is going to be radically different and you're going to be more alive and more present and more joyful and more appreciative and all these things. And I find it's very rare for someone to tap into that way of living without going through tremendous trauma. It's like, it gives us this perspective that we wouldn't have got any other way. And yeah, it's almost, I meet somebody who tells me they agree with that way of thinking and I ask them, so what happened to you? <laughs> That's my first question. Right, like, right, oh, right. They say that they share all of these things. I'm like, okay, what happened to you? Tell me right. about your story. Right. And have you ever met somebody who was just like, no, I just read a really good book and like adopted it. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> they usually, they always, they've always come with, well, this is what happened to me. And then I get their story. So yeah. Yeah. And what a gift of like, just recognizing that little stuff is little stuff, you know, like right. traffic and rain. And I use the analogy of like a bad haircut. I'm a short hair girl. And so haircuts are everything. And, you know, be looking cute and looking like a 12 year old boy is like a very subtle difference, right? A good haircut versus a bad haircut makes all the difference in the world. The one time I got the worst haircut of my life. I got this awful haircut. It was like a bowl cut. It was awful. And so for, for most women, you know, it would have been the end of the world and they would have hit away in, in hiding until it grew out or whatever. But I just was like, you know what, this is a haircut. Like, and in the grand scheme of things, this actually doesn't matter, but we can, we get tunnel vision and we live in these little bubble and li our lives. And we, we think, we know what's important. We think we know what matters. And it takes that bubble getting burst for you to realize what you thought was important really wasn't important. And so while we're the process of the bubble bursting, it's very painful and we wouldn't ask for it. And we would all just prefer to live in our bubbles for our entire life. <laughs> like we can, um, we can. Oh, Rosie's making some more comments. Let me just see. She's, she went uh, and did a week in Disney with her youngest grandson. And it was a beautiful time. You feel sad that it's over. And Rosie, that's, see, that's amazing. And that's not that's, to say that you wouldn't have wanted to do that, but like we, we invest in those memories and those experiences yeah. because we understand that our time is short. It's not guaranteed and we are going to make the most. And so that's beautiful that you did that. I'm so yeah. glad that you did that. I, I'm, I'm going like this because it's amazing. Um, when my father died, my family had been saving up to go to Disney World. And after he died, there was one less person to pay for. I mean, mm. let's just be real. <laughs> we didn't need as much money. And my mom wanted to take us, but she thought people would like look down at her thinking, well, your husband just died and you're taking the kids to Disney World. Mm. And everybody gave her love and support. So she did. Yeah. Uh, so after my father died, I went to Disney World. And after my mother died, it was just ironic that we were planning a trip with our children to Disney World. So oh. I again went oh. to Disney World and it kind of became a joke that Yeah, like don't plan anymore. If you've ever watched the Super Bowl, the MVP of the Super Bowl always announces, I've just oh. been named Super Bowl MVP. What are you doing next? And they're like, I'm going to Disney World. <laughs> yeah, it just became this thing. But it's the the experiences and that that opportunity that you opened the door to allow joy in your life. Yeah, that's a huge thing that you did. Um, yeah, good for you. Yeah, good, good job, Rosie. And even if you're not ready for joy, I know in the case of my mom's passing, she passed away a couple weeks before my birthday, and I had had a trip to Mexico planned before she passed away because in Minnesota it's freezing cold in February. <laughs> and my goal every year was like, just make it to your birthday. And then I always did a trip for my birthday somewhere warm to get recharged and endure the rest of the winter. And so, and when she died, she died on February 1st. And I, part of me like felt wrong for going on this trip, you know? Um, but I'm so glad that I did. And I really would encourage that for anyone because it's such a gift when you're inundated with feelings and memories and triggers and your house and, you know, to go somewhere that is not attached, you know, right. to be able to go and just have a different surroundings, different scenery, and like really take a break from your, your life and your responsibilities and just be a place where you can rest and reflect and recover. Like that week in Mexico was such a gift to me. And so I really, honestly, if you lose someone, I really would encourage you if you're at all able 
take a week and go somewhere. Just go yep. somewhere Jeez. fabulous. Go somewhere warm. I always <laughs> vote for warm personally. That's my, that's my vacation go tos. But um, and I know like that was such a huge you you did it like extra because <laughs> you I again, pretty much did the mega Super Bowl of grief. So you took the <laughs> mega Super Bowl trip like. <laughs> I what? did. So if people are watching, I'll, I'll share what I, I, I have a 32 foot motorhome and RV and I've loved traveling and camping. Um, my husband, and I planned to do it together. And obviously we didn't get to, to the extent we wanted, uh, but I had made some promises to him. So the big trip I planned was literally a 14,000 mile trip over almost three months um, where I circled the entire United States in my motor home. We left, I live in Northern Wisconsin where it's also very cold in winter. Um, and we left Wisconsin on day one of the trip and we didn't come back into the state until almost three months later. Wow. And I'm, I'm a teacher, so I have that summertime free, but I did have to take time from work and my, my school was really supportive. You know, like I said, they had watched me go through all of those losses and they, they looked at me and said, whatever you think you need to do, go do it. And I said, okay, thank you. And packed up the camper and took my kids. Yeah. Which taking two teenage kids, yeah, they were not fine space <laughs> across the country, like grief or no grief. That's like superhero status right there. Yeah. To begin with. So, oh my goodness. Who, did, Ro who didn't want to go. They didn't want to go and they of were course. forced to go. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Teenagers. Um, Rosie's from Wisconsin. Oh my gosh. Oh. We're making connections right here. <laughs> Whereabouts in Wisconsin, Rosie, let us know. Um, also, there was a comment from MB who says uh, his father-in-law died last May and it's his his kid's first experience with loss. And he's worked in mental health where he work, works with people who are stuck in their grief for years and he's wanting to know how to help others. Yeah, please. Let's connect, reach out. We do. So Kristen is one of our certified coaches on our team. We do have um, an opportunity for people to join our team, but we also have a certification program for, for people like you, MB, or counselors, or people who just want um, practical uh, uh, tools for people that have gone through grief. And so we do have a certification option for that because, you know, our heart is to just get these tools in the hands of everybody possible because, I don't mind saying like, I feel like as a country, as a culture, we are missing the mark. You know, we are not doing well with how to support people who are grieving. We're not doing well with teaching people, number one, that recovery and healing is possible and available, you know, um, and then the how to's of that, you know, what are the practical how to's of grieving well? And what are the things that could keep you stuck? You know, as we and um, it breaks my heart, I meet and talk with people on a daily basis that it's been years and years and they are just stuck in their grief. They never moved, you know, they never learned how to move through it. Oh, Rosie is in Florida. She's retired in Florida and comes home every summer. Rosie. Okay. Now I need to know where you are in Florida because I actually, I live down in Florida and I am here in Minnesota for the summer as we speak, which is the best experience, the best of both worlds to be able to do Florida and Minnesota is, or Wisconsin, that's great. So um, Rosie would love to hear where you are in Florida. Venice, okay, get out. That's about an I was. <laughs> I'm in Cape Coral. I'm about an hour from you. So Rosie, I just feel like we're destined to meet. We're destined to connect. <laughs> yes. You're in our backyard in both, in every case. We need to hear where in Wisconsin. I'm in Minocqua, which oh, is Oh, yeah, she answered north. that. I did. She's near Madison. Oh, okay. I love yeah. Madison area. Love that yeah. area. So that is not too far. Well, we are coming up uh, on time, but Kristen, I appreciate you being here so much. I thank you for the folks that are tuning in, the folks that catch it on the replay. Just we're going to be here every Thursday talking about different topics and um, answering questions and all that kind of stuff. So appreciate it. Do you have any final words, comments, suggestions for Rosie besides the gratitude journal, which she said she's going to adopt? Yeah, actually I do. Um, with the gratitude, it's about the gratitude journal. Now you can go out and purchase a beautiful gratitude journal that's pre-made that you can fill in if that's, you know, your jam. Um, and I didn't, I just grabbed a little notebook that I had laying around the house that I had used for other things and ripped out the pages, you know, that didn't apply. Um, but what was really powerful for me was keeping that gratitude journal together. So I would put the date on there and then three bullet points. 
and I'd, ha- I'd force myself to fill in three things each day to be grateful for. And then what was really cool is when I got, when I had been doing it for weeks and months, I could look back. Yeah. And see and remind myself of what I had been grateful for. So you can get a really lavish gratitude journal or (laughs) you can grab a sheet of paper. It doesn't matter. Love that. She says she's a notebook gal. So yeah, absolutely. And I love the piece about um, going back and looking because part of grieving and, and being able to move through it is to acknowledge your progress, right? Like you're getting through it, you're taking steps and to look back to realize how far you've come and that you're still standing and you're still putting one foot in front of the other. That really helps to even mentally, neurologically convince your mind that you are going to, you know, you are going to get through this and recover. So great conversation today. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We will see you all next week. All right. See ya.